Matthew chapter 6. We've been talking over the last several weeks about how to discern the will of God. And we've been talking about how that if you want joy and peace and purpose in your life, then you have, it's all found in the, in the will of God. And in order to find the will of God, we need to uh, discern, a have a vision to discern what God wants us to do. And so we was talking about it last Wednesday night, how that when God gives us a vision, it's usually the end. He sort of gives us his vision of what we're going to be. And then we begin to make uh, an action plan to get there. And sometimes the journey takes us on various routes before we finally find out exactly uh, where God wants us to be and what God wants us to do. But the mission statement for you today, if you are a believer, is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. This is the map. This is the guideline to what all of us, as children of God, what all of us should be striving to do. We need to put this on your t-shirt. No matter who you are this morning, this is created to do. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, if you read the scripture above this, this is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus gets to this section and he begins to talk about things that you need. He talks about you need clothing, you need shelter, you need food, and you worry about those things, he says. But Jesus says you ought not worry about those things because God's got you. He's going to take care of you based upon this promise that if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these other things will be added to you as well. Now, we oftentimes get confused between what we want and what we need. My family gets together uh, on Tuesday nights. All the grandchildren come over, and my daughter and son-in-laws and son and daughter-in-law, they all come over. And uh, I've got this one grandbaby that she's a spitfire, kind of like cowboy. And uh, man, she, she demands attention. And as soon as she gets there, you know, she's ready to eat. And you ready to eat? Yes. She wants ice cream. Every Tuesday night, it's the first thing she wants, ice cream and candy. And uh, that's what she wants, but we try to convince her that's not what she needs. You know, a lot of times we're like, my granddaughter, we have these wants and these needs confused. We want this guy until we find out he's a drunk and an abuser and a cheater. We want that money until we find out that money changes who we are and our values. We want that popularity until we find out we can't handle the sexual temptation that comes along with it. Maybe if we would focus first upon what we need, then God would give us the desires of our heart. Now, today we're spoiled. You really are. So am I. Because we live in a country where most of our needs, we don't really worry that much about, do we? But just suppose, and it's going to happen, maybe not in my lifetime, or it might. It's going to happen in somebody's lifetime that this grid is going to go off. Someday the internet is going to shut down and the electricity is going to go off. The grid is going to break. You can count on it. There's coming a day when we're going to get under some kind of attack or something's going to happen where you're off the grid. And suddenly there's no cell towers and no cell phones and no internet and no way to contact others. And we're going to find ourselves understanding the difference between wanting and needing. You see, today, all over the world, there are people that are literally starving to death, dying today. Some of them will not make it through the day. Hundreds of thousands are starving to death. Many today throughout our world are without water. They're without electricity. They're without shelter. 
You see, all these things we take for granted. We just think we're sort of entitled to that because of who we are. You see, there may come a day that we're like they are. And you're not going to be worried about that dating relationship or that man you can't have or that woman you can't get. Or you won't worry about how many friends you have on Facebook. You won't worry about how much retirement you have in your bank. You see, what you'll worry about then is what you need, what you need. And Jesus promises us in this scripture, he gives us a promise. He says, I'm going to take care of what you need if you will give me, if you will seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of these things will be added unto you. Now, I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to look at a couple of verses because I believe that when it comes to seeking first the kingdom of God, there are basically three things that we need to do. And I believe it's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 16 through 18. When it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Now listen to this part. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You see, in this passage, it says this is God's will for you. This is what God wills for your life. If you want joy... If you want peace, if you want a purpose in your life, God wills for that. As you seek first the kingdom of God, these are the three imperatives I believe that you must do. What is the first one? It says rejoice always. Secondly, pray continually. Third, give thanks in all circumstances. And I want you to notice that in each one of those imperatives, in each one of those commands, there is a continual for example, always, continually, in all circumstances. You see, there is a persistence, a never giving up. Now, first of all, it says rejoice always. Now, you say, well, Paul wrote that thousands of years ago. He has no earthly idea what I'm going through. My girlfriend just broke up with me. He has no idea. How in the world can I rejoice with all of my problems that I have right now? Well, let me just share a little bit about who Paul was writing to. He was writing to a church, and this church was in Thessalonica. And if you read the book of Acts, how Paul founded this church, it was he and Silas, as they traveled throughout that area, they nearly lost their lives bringing the gospel to this church. As a matter of fact, they had to escape the city under the cover of darkness. And even when the Jews from Thessalonica went after them, they hunted them down to the next city. And they stirred up the crowds everywhere Paul and Silas went. Later, when Paul wrote to this church in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, he says they welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And he brought them, the gospel to them, in the face of strong opposition. You see, to be a Christian then was not like to be a Christian now. To be a Christian now, we make it pretty simple on you, don't we? All you got to do is walk up front, say this little prayer with the preacher, and we'll put you in a baptismal pool. Then you pretty much go out and live your life any way you want to. But people who committed their lives to Christ back then knew that to commit their lives to Christ meant suffering was going to come to them. They would be under persecution. Many of them lost their jobs. They lost their family. They were outcasts from their family. They went through great discrimination. And yet Paul looked at this church that was going through this immense suffering and says, you are a model for other believers. They should imitate you because in the midst of your suffering, you are rejoicing always, rejoicing always. You see, Paul is not talking about rejoicing in the sense that we're always feeling this giddiness, that we're always feeling this happiness. If somehow your whole life is consumed with you finding some kind of point where you're always happy, then you got to understand God's not as concerned about that as you are. Do I think that God would like for you to be happy? Yes. 
But there are times, you know, would I like for my own children to be happy? Of course I would. When they were younger, did I want them to be happy? I was more concerned, though, about their doing and being right than I was about their own happiness at times. Would you agree with that? Though sometimes you think, well, your happiness may come at the expense of your life. <laughs> it would be better for me to make you unhappy sometimes in order to get the things you really always want. God is not going to always, is not always concerned with your happiness. Let me tell you what God is concerned with. God is concerned not with your happiness, but with your holiness. Your holiness. What does it mean to be holy? You say, well, I can't ever be holy. Oh, yes, you can. If you're a child of God, you already are. You just don't know it. You see, the Bible teaches that holiness means to be set apart for the use of God. Now, let me say this to you, and I want you to hear me and hear me clearly. If you are not set apart for the use of God, you've yet to understand what salvation is really all about. Salvation is not about you one day dying and going to heaven. That's just a byproduct of your holiness. You see, God saved you to use you in this world for his kingdom's cause. God has set you apart as a vessel for his use. And you're never as a believer. You're, the most miserable person in the world is not a lost person. It's not a person that doesn't know Jesus. You see, the most miserable person in the world is a person that knows Jesus and is yet living contrary to the will of God. A person that's lost, oh, they can find temporary happiness in the drugs and the sex and doing whatever they want to do. They can find that happiness. But when, as a believer, when you try to find happiness in the wrong places, what happens? The Holy Spirit convicts you. You find yourself under the judgment of God. You find yourself under the oppression of the hand of God. You find yourself opposing the Holy Spirit. You find all things coming against you. And you find you can't be happy in the church. And you can't be happy in the world. You're miserable in both. Somewhere along the way, you're going to have to make a decision like Joshua did. Choose this day. Who are you going to serve? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, he says. That's where we, we've got to make that decision. You've got to begin to view yourself differently. View yourself differently. I had a brother come up here this morning. We've been talking about being called into the gospel ministry. He says, I feel like I'm being called to, to preach. And I understand what he's saying. But let me say this to all of you in this room. If you are a child of God, you have been called into the gospel ministry, each and every one of you. You have been. And if you have yet to receive that call and answer that call in the affirmative, you are lost. You are lost. And you are just being deceived because God has called all of us into his gospel ministry. All of us he has gifted. All of us he has gifted, he has talented in order to be used for his honor and his glory and his kingdom's sake. You see, Paul is not talking about this little temporary happiness because you are made not for this world, but you are made for another world. And this world you're living in right now is simply a training ground for eternity. A training ground for eternity. You are being made in the image of Christ. The scripture that I quote probably the most often is Romans 8, 28. For all things work together for the good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. But we can't stop there. Because if you think all things work together for the good, then that, meaning that, that means that you're going to be always happy, then you've forgotten the next verse. Because Romans 8, 29 says, For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, to the likeness of his Son. You are predestined to be made into the image of Christ, to become to think like Christ, to become to act like Christ, to become to behave like Christ. That's what God's training you to do. And through the good and the bad that comes in your life, all these things are working together for the good, and that good being that you are made more more like Jesus than you were yesterday. God is calling out warriors today. And we need warriors who understand who they are in God. We need to rejoice. Now, to rejoice also, the word, very word carries with it to delight. It means to delight. We can delight in the Lord and the relationship that we have with him and that we know that God is cares for us. Is there someone 
that you think about, and every time you think about them, you just have this joy in your, in your heart. I've got some grandkids like that, man. I do. Man, I anticipate them coming over on Tuesday night. And sometimes I'm at school and I'll think about something they did or something they said. And man, my heart is just well up in joy no matter what's going on around me. And a lot of you relate to that, don't you? You relate to that. And that's how God feels about you. And that's how you should feel about him. You should delight that God loves you. And whenever you think about God, you shouldn't be worried and, and upset and, and feeling like you're a disappointment. Instead, you should just delight in the fact that God loves you and he's got such a great plan for your life and a purpose for your life. You know, I see and I've been in the room of people, saints of God that were believers that were dying. I've been there when they drew their last breath. And I have never in my life felt the calm that I have in those rooms. The peace that even comes over the family of those that are gathered by. I've often used this story, but Brother Gene knows exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about Aaron Stubblefield. He was a deacon of the church with Brother Gene now when I first went to Fulton Baptist Church. And I don't know how many of you, any of you even know Brother Aaron, but, but he was a godly man, man. He was saved. And let me tell you, when Brother Aaron got saved as a, as a man, he was radically saved. He used to be an old moonshiner, you know, uh, running whiskey. And, and when he got saved, he was radically saved. Man, they had a little place down there at Fulton's out there near Fort Pillar. Had a little grocery store down there, Carmen's Grocery. I don't know if y'all ever heard that. And they had a little, also another little club down there. And Brother Aaron would just barge into those places and just start talking about Jesus, man. He would just go in there and he would just talk about Jesus all the time. They hated to see him coming in. I, I know they did because it was a buzz kill to all of them. You know, here come brother. Oh, oh, how'd you be? Here come brother Aaron. He's going to be talking about Jesus again today. And, and that's what he talked about. That was his life, you know. He just loved Jesus. And, and I remember when brother Aaron got sick and, and going to the hospital <clears throat> up there in Tipton County and he didn't know I was there, and, and I knew he was hurting. And, and I walked into that uh, emergency room, not the emergency room, the intensive care unit, and, and Brother Aaron was back there in one of those rooms. And, and as I got closer to the door, I could just hear him moaning in there in pain. I could hear him say, oh, Jesus. Oh, help me, Jesus. And I remember uh, walking in that room, and, and when he saw me, all of a sudden he got himself together. And he said, hey, Brother Wade, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, my goodness. As much pain as you're in, you worried about me? And uh, as I sit there and talk to Brother Aaron, I, his last words to me were these. He said, you know, Brother Wade, he said, uh, if the Lord takes me home, I'm ready to go. If the Lord leaves me here, I'm going to serve him. And I walked out of that room that day and brother Aaron went on to be with the Lord that very night and um, I remember going to the funeral and preaching his funeral and one of the things that the Lord gave me was how could he die like that how could he die like that I that's the kind of man that's the kind of person I'd like to be when I die I would like to have that kind of faith and I'd like to ha have that kind of joy that when I know that I, that day is the day that I'm going to see Jesus face to face, that I have that confidence. And I'll tell you exactly why Brother Aaron died like a Christian. Because he lived like one. He lived like one. Each and every day. He was, lived a life of delighting and rejoicing in the Lord, even when it looked like the circumstances and situation were impossible. The second command of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, I think, is not only to rejoice always, but to pray continually. Now, the word here in the Greek actually means to face in a direction or to speak it out loud. You see, what prayer is really 
It's to bring your whole life before God. It's the turning over of your thoughts and needs and desires to him. Now, how do we pray continually? I mean, do we pray uh, all day long? We can't be on our knees. Well, that's not what pray continually means. You see, pray continually actually doesn't simply mean constantly making requests. It is the recognition that you are constantly in communication with God. It is that idea that God is one thought away, that no matter where you go and where you are, he's right there beside you, and at any moment, you can talk to him. Look, I don't know if you've ever had that kind of relationship with Jesus, but if you haven't, you've missed out. Man, I, I, I promise you, I'm not on my knees 24 hours a day, but I'm in communication with God at all times. At any moment, I can call, and, and, and I know that he's going to hear my prayer. Now, let me say this. I, for some of us, when you pray, and I want you to be serious with me. For, when you pray, where do you picture God? Do you picture him in heaven? Do you picture God up there on the throne, way out there, when you make your request to him? Or do you picture him right here beside you? Let me tell you where he is. He's right beside you. The Bible says, I will never leave you lonely nor forsake you. I will walk with you all the way. Jesus is right beside you. And, and to pray continually simply means that you recognize his presence, that, he, that he's right there with you at all times. You're never alone. And you can bring your request to God, but sometimes it's just praising God. It's just rejoicing in God. It's offering your whole self up to him and walking in daily communion with him. Even when you're in a crowded room or when you're all alone, he's right there on your mind. On your mind. God, what do you want me to do right now? God, why did that just happen? God, what are you trying to teach me right now? It's that constant communication with God. You know, God uh, delights in you. Whether you believe it or you don't, God wants to communicate with you. He wants to commune with you. You know, uh, I don't know how many of you like it. I know the Harrisons love it. Like to watch their kids play ball. You like to watch your kids play ball? <laughs> I like to watch kids play. I'm a PE teacher. I get paid to watch kids play. Isn't that an awesome job? <laughs> I like to watch them play, man. I do. I get, I get excited for them, you know. Now, I, I know that when my own kids used to play and when the Harrison's kids, they, when they play, I know, man, when they come up there to bat in the baseball game, mama's heart's beating faster than theirs is. She's all worried, man. She's all wanting them to make that good play, to do that right thing. Brandy's the same way. When Emmanuel's out there shooting that basketball in that game, she's more nervous than he is because, you know what? She just delights in that, you know? You cheer for them. You know what? God's cheering for you. God's delighting in watching you. He just wants you to recognize he's in the stands. Here I am. I'm watching you play. I'm right here. I got you. He cheers for you, just like your mom and daddy cheer for you. He's cheering for you right now. Go, man, go. Get it. Do it. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to be successful. We live in a world packed with so many things that pushes God aside. And Paul urges us that we bring our lives, our desires, our concerns, and our needs before God over and over again as we abide in his presence. And the last thing is this. When I seek first the kingdom of God, not only do I, not only do I rejoice always, not only do I um, abide in his presence and, and uh, pray continually, but last thing I do is this, give thanks in all circumstances. Man, we're coming upon Thanksgiving, and there's nothing that God loves more than a grateful heart. As a matter of fact, he says, enter into his courts with thanksgiving and praise. What does that mean, enter into his courts? It means enter into his presence. You know, we are, we just kind of like get so we're just complainers. 
<laughs> we gripe and complain. Well, God, how come that happened to me? God, why did that happen to me? You know what we need to do? Sometimes we just need to tilt our head in a little different direction. Let me tell you something. There's people right now that have little kids in the hospital down in St. Jude that's never going to come out today. Somewhere today, there's a woman who's beaten bloodied by a man who promised to love her for the rest of his life and her life. There's somebody today in a nursing home that every single person in this whole world has forgotten about. There's little kids today that are hungry that will not live to see another sunrise. You need to tilt your head in a little different direction. You need to, instead of counting your curses for just a moment, count your blessing. You know, Paul, he got to see Jesus on his road to Damascus. He looked up one day and there was Jesus and Jesus gave him this vision and, and he got to see Jesus. So, of course, you could say, well, of course, Paul should give thanks. But let me tell you what happened to Paul. His own, through his own words. In 2 Corinthians verse 11, 21 through 29, it says this. It says, whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently. Listen, listen, to, listen to his resume. <laughs> He says, you think, they think they're Christians. Listen, listen, to what, listen to me. Listen to my resume. They think they're better Christians than me. Okay, well, I've been in prison more times. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and the night in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from the river, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger uh, at the sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I have faced daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, I don't feel weak, and who is led into sin that I do not inwardly burn. Now that's Paul's resume. Yeah? He's bragging about this. He said, I know I'm a fool. I shouldn't be doing this, but I got to brag for just a moment because I want to prove to you that I am a child of God. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ and so he's bragging about what his suffering you see Paul saying my proof of my Christianity is the very fact that I'm willing to suffer for God I'm willing how much suffering are we willing before we turn our back on Jesus how much suffering before we begin to complain but it, yet what does Paul say in everything give Thanks. In all circumstances, in all situations, we should have gratitude. You know, it's a spiritual law, this gratitude thing. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or lost. It really doesn't. You know, the reason I know that is because I work with recovery. And a person can come in there and they cannot even know God at all. They don't even have to know God. They don't have to believe in Jesus or nothing else. But if they're depressed and I tell them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit down, take this piece of paper and this pencil, and I want you to write down five things you are grateful for. Immediately their mood changes. Because there's something about gratitude that tilts our head in a little different direction. You see, as believers, we have an advantage we can give thanks in all circumstances because we know that in all circumstances no matter the good or the bad no matter what's going on in our life God is there with us he's there you see <laughs> Shadrach Meshach and Abednego were men who faced a fiery furnace that they didn't bow down to this idol that that King Nebuchadnezzar made you the bow you're going to burn they said you know what this is what the reply was whether we burn or not we will not bow 
For our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, but that's his choice. So let us burn, because we're not going to bow. And you know the story. Nebuchadnezzar threw them in the fire. The people that threw them in the fire, the men that threw them in the fire, actually were burned up themselves. It was so hot. And Nebuchadnezzar looked in that fire and he said, whoa, I threw in three, but I see four. You see, even in that fiery furnace, God's with you. God's with you. Paul and Silas, they, they uh, were thrown in prison. Man, for what? Casting out a demon of, out of a little girl. And what did they do? They sang praises and hymns while in prison. So much as they sang praises, the, the doors began to open because of the earthquake that took place. Now, I also know that a few years after that, that Paul was taken to Rome. And we know he rejoiced in the prison after being beaten and flogged and then put in shackles. But a few years later, Paul looked across and he saw this Roman centurion with a blade in his hand. And Paul knew that that Roman centurion was going to take off his head. For doing what? Preaching the gospel. And he looked at that Roman centurion that was going to take off his head and according to tradition, Paul ran to the stone. He was ready to see Jesus again. You see, our lives is not just about this life. It's about a life to come. And even when God doesn't always deliver us in the way we think we should, he should, God's always got a reason behind it because lastly, God knows and sees what we do not know and what we do not see. He's the writer of history. He knows how sin affects generations and he knows how a born-again believer affects generations. Some of you have already changed the generational curses that your dad and mom gave to you. You're already on the process of doing that. The things that they couldn't give you, you're now giving your children, which is hope and faith. You see, sometimes on the ground level, we're too close to the events of our lives that we can't see the forest for the trees. We don't see how things are linked together, but God does. We don't see how things are shaped up. We don't understand how it all works together. But from God's perspective, it all makes sense. Even what you're going through right now, to God, it all makes sense because even in that, there's purpose. And God's going to use it. Somehow, some way, God's going to use it. Now, are you ready to seek the kingdom of God in your life? Are you ready? Let's begin by rejoicing always. Let's begin by praying continually and recognizing his presence and by giving thanks in all circumstances. Now